questions. All right, so I'm here this evening to discuss bird photography. And what I'm gonna do is just discuss a little bit about my bird photography and how I shoot and with how I shoot. And then I'll dive right into it and show you some images. I'd like to share some of the fascinating birds that I've photographed and also to give you some tips and tricks on how to photograph birds. I know a lot of birders and most of the, a lot of the birders that I know use their binoculars, but some of them have cameras. And I thought maybe I could share a couple of tips here or there to help you out with photography. I'm sure some of you are wonderful photographers. So just to, just to get started, I'll show you, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how I shoot. So I shoot in manual mode. Everything is manual, even ISO. There are some photographers who use auto ISO. I prefer to be in control of everything. I shoot, well, most 98% of the photos that you will see are shot with my 1DX. That's what I was using. It's a Canon 1DX. That's what I was using for about six years. I just recently switched cameras, but I think there's only one shot tonight from that camera, and that's the R5 if anyone's curious. And I shoot with a 100 to 400 millimeter and a 500 millimeter. And that one I use a tripod. It's a little heavy. I could handhold it for about 30 to 60 seconds and that's it. I shoot in RAW and I post-process in Lightroom and Photoshop. I use my histogram. We'll, we'll touch on that briefly. I expose to the right and I have my blinkies on. We'll, we'll get there. Um, I use evaluative metering most of the time. And every shot in this presentation is shot in the wild. So I, I love to sit for hours. I, I love to watch birds' behaviors. I listen to them and I learn. If I want to approach a scene, let's say I want to get a little bit closer to, let's say, a northern harrier sitting on a, a post, I will wait to see that he's preening or he's looking the other way and I'll take two or three little steps very, very quietly and I'll just wait. And if he looks at me, I'll back up or I'll just uh, freeze. And I just walk very slowly. I don't disturb them. If they seem disturbed, I will back up because it's the bird's uh, well-being ahead of everything else. I respect the animals and I love them. I could sit like all, you know, every day, all day and do this. And it's funny, I had this, I've, I've given this presentation before uh, on wildlife photography. So I just took out all my animals and threw in all, I mean, all the, the mammals and the foxes and the bears and the lions and, and I threw in everything about birds. But this was actually in there because I, I love people to know that, as I mentioned, the well-being of the birds come first. You have to be super careful around nests or even avoid being around the nests. Avoid baiting at all times. I'm sure you have this in New York as well, but there are some people who do a lot of baiting and I'm not... Anyway, we won't get into that. Uh, so avoid playback, avoid flash, especially with nocturnal birds. And I don't know if you could read that, but that is the link. That little blue line is a link. Um, we're getting to the photos in two seconds. I love interactions between birds, and I also love capturing a moment where the bird seems to be interacting with me. Not that I'm just, oops, sorry, one second. I'm trying to just move. There, I'm trying to move this over so I can read what I wrote. Um, so I like, I like when there's some type of interaction where they're looking in my direction not looking away or flying away or butt shot. So I would prefer this as opposed to this or this. I find there's not much of an interaction there, but if I'm looking at you, much more of an interaction. Okay, now my screen is not ruined. We're gonna, we're gonna get this, we're gonna get this. I'm just gonna move you guys back, okay. So uh, this is a snowy owl in Kingston, Ontario at Amherst Island and I snuck out on this bird, and at this point, I, I stopped photographing because he looked a little freaked out to me, so I, I stepped away. This is, um, I'm sure you all know this, but I'll tell you anyway, but uh, a wood duck in eclipse plumage. And in this photo, I'm lying on the, on the beach, on my belly, right at the water's level. 
this is an example of what a bird is not supposed to look like when you're photographing. I was actually out with an ornithologist and we were walking through the woods and we came across the sawwet. And it, as you can see, he had just finished his prey. He has a little bit of blood on his belly. And we almost walked right into him. I snapped a shot really, really quickly and we left because we didn't want to disturb him. But that is a beautiful sawwet. And we have a mandarin duck here. I think you guys, you guys had one in um, Central Park, I believe. This is, this is a little mandarin duck that I shot and I waited for some type of interaction. And this one, we didn't have a great eruption this year. There were only maybe two or three great gray owls around the island, but I went out and I finally, after maybe 16 hours of walking around in the snow, I finally found this beauty. And uh, he looked, oh, Yes, he looked at me for a moment. I remember why. And this is the one shot that I shot with my new camera. And it's a yellow warbler. And he just, he was perturbed because there were three warblers flying around. And he totally didn't even realize I was there. Maybe there was a yellow warbler behind me or something, but he looked right at me. So I love to get the eyes of the bird, but I also love the eye of the prey to be visible if possible. So here we've got a little blue with a very unfortunate animal, a little lizard. And you can see the eye of the prey. And here, this is Nickerson Beach. I love Nickerson Beach so much and I cannot wait till the borders open up so I can come back down again. I've been there for quite a few summers. And here we have the eye of the prey visible as well as the eye of the bird. And an anhinga, the bird is, I mean, the prey is upside down. My preference would have been the other way, but you can still see the eye. And as I mentioned, I like to get down to the level of the bird. So this is the same pond. We have a pond about 15 minutes from my house and it, they're the most friendly ducks I've ever seen, other than the mallards, because so many ducks, as you know, are so skittish. And but these guys just, just pose for you almost. And this is shot at 1 hundredth of a second, which is not necessary for a stationary bird, but I, it was at f4.5 and the lighting was beautiful so it worked out this one is shot at one six six thousand four hundredth of a second which is also not necessary because the bird is not in flight but it as you know the whites are so bright and it was 5.6 because i wanted the background blurred and it was so bright that i just brought down the speed so it wouldn't have, it wouldn't be all blown out and that's me that's, uh, I, like, I love to shoot with my dad. My dad's a photographer. He's been a photographer my whole life. I just got into it 10 years ago. Uh, I was in Florida visiting my folks. They have a place there, they're snowbirds. And my, everyone was sleeping. So I grabbed my dad's camera and I took off to Wakota Hatchie. And there was a red-winged blackbird and it, it did his call and it brought up his wings and I clicked the shutter I was like, Oh my gosh, I love this. This is fantastic. And, and I, was, I was hooked from then on. I joined the Montreal Camera Club. I submitted images. Um, they got torn apart, but I learned how to improve upon my images. And, and uh, I love it. I just keep, keep doing it. So Marbled Godwit in Florida. The background is actually the beach. So it's at low tide and I'm in the ocean with my tripod shooting back towards the beach, but it was so far away, it's all blurred. And this is at one, one, one thousandth of a second, which is fine for a bird that's not really moving around that much at that point. Now, birds in flight. I like to follow the rule of thirds. I made this lovely diagram right before we started. This is the rule of thirds. You want the point of interest on one of these uh, spots. And it just, I guess studies show that the eye is drawn to these spots. You also want to give your subject room to move into. So twice the distance in front of the bird as in back of the bird. So that the bird feels, you feel like the bird has room to move into. This is a roseate spoonbill at Stick Marsh in Florida. And i just happy to grab him with a stick, building a nest at Stick Marsh. This is at one three thousand two hundredth of a second. Birds in flight, I like it at least one thirty two hundredth of a second. My ISO is bumped up because I want I wanted six point three the f stop, so I have more of a depth of field. 
and I also wanted the speed, so my ISO is high. And it's not really that noisy. I do use Topaz Denoise to bring the noise down, or sometimes just Lightroom. This is at Barnegat Jetty, and this is at also 1 3200th of a second. And I don't know if it needed to go that much faster because the wingtips, well, they're a little bit blurred. It could go 1 4,000th of a second, or if I had the, the light, which I did at this moment, it could have gone 1 5,000th of a second. This is Conowingo Dam, eagle. <laughs> Just in case you didn't know it was an eagle. Um, this is 1 1,600th of a second, which is kind of surprising. I guess because I got it on the downbeat, it paused for a second and it looked sharp, but it should have been faster. 1 3,000th, 1 4,000th. And unfortunately, he had eaten the head, so I don't have the eye of the prey, but he's still carrying a fish. This, I was actually at uh, feeders. We have this beautiful park in the West Island, in well, where, where I live, about 25 minutes from where I live. And I just literally stood there and waited for this beauty to leave the, the branch, because I knew he was going to be flying to the feeders. It's a little bit of cheating, but there's my, my cardinal shot for you. And this one, I actually don't remember. This was about 1 4,000th of a second. Now this is not <clears throat> the most amazing shot photographically because of the mess in the background with all of the branches. However, it is an Eastern screech owl. And I'm lecturing to the Audubon um, Society or Association, so I figured you guys probably know, I've never seen a screech owl in flight before. I've, I've only just seen them sticking their head out of a hole with their eyes closed, or I was amazed to see it on the branch. Maybe, maybe you have all seen it in flight, and I'm, I'm sounding very silly, but I was amazed to see it. I saw it, there were five chickadees, and they were disturbing it, and I saw it poop, and I saw it get ready, and I was shooting with my dad, and I said, Dad, it's gonna fly, but he didn't hear me because he can't hear very well. So he missed it, and I just click, 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 got it, followed it, and was very pleased to get an Eastern Screech Owl in flight. So this is a green heron um, at a beautiful place that I go to that's about 35 minutes away. So where I'm at, I have all these incredible places about 20 to 45 minutes from where I live. I was walking around one of these parks, it's called Techno Park, and this guy just happened to fly over my head. I wasn't really even prepared, which you always should be if you're walking around, be prepared for a bird to fly over. I happened to have been at one five thousandth of a second. But I think I would have preferred 1 3200th of a second at 7.1 to get more of a depth of field because maybe I would have had the head a little sharper. So I use AI Servo, um, which is because my subject is moving. If I'm shooting just a stationary object, I could, or bird, or animal, which is not that often, but I can use one shot for a portrait. But I use Servo. And in, in Nikon, if you're shooting Nikon, it's AFC autofocus. And I don't know Fuji or Olympus or all these amazing, or Sony, all these amazing new systems, but uh, you could look into that. So birds in flight again. As I mentioned, I love to go up to about one five thousandth of a second. And for hummingbirds or bees, anything that's that are moving their wings really, really quickly, we need at least one four thousandth, one five thousandth of a second. This guy was shot at one twenty five hundredth of a second. It should have been shot faster. I should have bumped up my ISO and shot at 1 4,000th. As you can see, the wingtips are moving. Now, a lot of people say, yes, but hummingbirds move so quickly, you, we just know it implies motion. And I'm okay with that. But some people like the wingtips to be totally sharp. I like it when the eye is sharp. I think that's the most important thing. If the eye is not sharp, I'll probably just discard the image right away. This one is 13200 of a second. I could have bumped up the ISO, but this was an old camera. This, this shot I shot probably about eight years ago, and it didn't handle the ISO that well back then. I like to wait for that special moment. 
So here's, here's the shot. I went to Africa, September 2018. It was the best trip of my life. And I was dying to see this lilac-breasted roller because it was my favorite bird I, I could imagine. I've never seen it before. We got, you know, we were, we saw it and I could get it. I had my 500 with my 1.4 X extender. So I was at 700 millimeters. And I, he was pretty small in the frame, but I was so excited. But he was there for so long because he had caught a beetle. So the driver, the guide, backed up and went a little bit closer and then backed up and went a little bit closer. And I shot with my 700 millimeter, with my 500, and I filled the frame and I was just ecstatic. Uh, this shot won a, a gold medal in uh, Canada, across Canada. This one is um, a marsh wren. I love these guys. My, my shot that I still haven't gotten, but I will go back for hours until I get it, is the two claws on either reed and singing with his mouth open. I will get that, and maybe I'll send it to you guys once I get it to say, here, I got it. But here he was preparing his nest with these... Um, cat, what are they called? Cattails. Now this guy was in Bosky and he had a rat and he had about five other cranes chasing him around the field. And I anticipated where they were gonna go. I was wearing an Arctic parka, my minus 40 degree boots, hat, scarf. I had my tripod with my 500 and I literally sprinted down the road in anticipation of where he was gonna end up that it was that was at the right sun angle because I love to shoot with the sun at my back so that my shadow is pointing at the bird or the animal or whatever I'm shooting so it it um, decreases shadows um, there are exceptions to that rule I love backlit photography as well but at this point I wanted the bat the sun at my back so I sprinted down down the road and I got this shot of him running away from the others the others are just outside the frame. And here, this moment, um, this hairy woodpecker is eating the tree and I've got the stuff flying out of the tree. Now, just very briefly, this is a little complicated, but I love to expose to the right. I'm going to just talk about the histogram for one minute. A lot of the information is on the right side of the histogram. So as you can see, the middle, the medium, the light, and the very light. We want most of the information shifted over to the right-hand side without being blown out. So something like this, this is very, very dark. It's, oh, it's underexposed, and it's going to lead to a lot of noisy photographs if you try to bring out the shadows afterwards. So increase your exposure. This is exposed to the left and sometimes used in nighttime shooting, but it can still get noisy. So increase your exposure. This is okay, but you have the most details and the best choice for lowest noise if you're exposing to the right without exposing all the way to the right. Because your blinkies are gonna be going crazy here. This is so overexposed because everything's so bright. Here you have to bring your exposure down. So you want your histogram to look like this. On, in Canon, it's over to the fourth bar. In Nikon, it's over to the fifth bar without any blinkies. Blinkies are, I don't know what you call them, zebra stripes, it's the flashing lights when the whites are too blown out. It might look a little washed out on the LCD, but when you're exposing to the right in post-processing, you know, in Lightroom, you fix the whites and the blacks and the contrast and the clarity. It's going to look beautiful. So, as I mentioned, set your highlights, put your highlight warning to on. There are always exceptions to the rules. For example, at sunset or shooting out of a dark room to the bright outdoors. Those are some exceptions. So, more of what I like to shoot. I love behavior, interactions, actions of birds. I love love and I love the love and tender moments. So, this is Nickerson Beach. And this is a mama turn with the baby. And if you look closely, you can see the egg tooth, which is still on the little beak that falls off. It just helps the little baby come out of the egg um, to peck its way out of the egg. And this is 
Elliston Island in Newfoundland. So you'll have to wait for the borders to open up if you want to come here. But this was August, actually. So maybe, who knows what will happen by August. This was, and the background is actually the rocks way off in the distance. A cliff, a rock cliff. So I got really lucky. These guys flew right up to me and started whispering sweet nothings in each other's ear. I, I love this shot. I just, I love puffins. And this one, I have to tell you a quick story about this one. It had been four years. I had put feelers out to everybody I knew who had a cottage saying, please, if you ever see a loon with a baby on its back, please, please, please let me know and I'm gonna come and photograph it. It was Thursday night, it was 10 p.m. I got a call from my friend, Nancy, and she said, I saw a baby with a, um, a loon with a baby on its back. I said, oh my gosh, can I come to your cottage tomorrow morning? Four o'clock the next day, so six hours later, I'm in my car, it's an hour and a half drive, you know, it's an hour drive because I got there at five. There was mist everywhere. The sun had not yet risen. I got into the canoe and I started paddling. And a, a loon, the male loon, flew over my head as if to say, follow me. So there, were, there was two ways I could have gone. So I followed him. But then the loon turned around and flew right over me, right over my canoe, as if to say, no, 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 not this way. Come this way. Turn the canoe around. And I went the other way. And as I turned the bend, and I'm not kidding, the mist lifted a little bit, and there was mama with baby on her back. And I think this might have been one of the last days, because that's a big baby. I went back a couple of days later, and the baby wasn't on the back anymore. And I, I was crying. Honestly, I had tears running down my face. I was so happy. And I shot, shot them for a little bit, and then I let them be. And I'm very, very happy with the shot. I love it. <laughs> I think that might be my favorite shot. Just having waited for four years and then having the loon fly over me and then tell me where to go. This is Bonaventure Island, Gaspé Z or Gaspé. And um, it's called fencing. It's a mating ritual, territorial ritual, mating ritual. The, this is Wakota Hatchie again. And male and female with inbreeding plumage. I love the little feathers on their heads in, in breeding plumage. This is actually at my parents' cottage at the lake and took out the canoe super early. Actually, this might be sunset. This was sunset. And was so happy when one of them flew in. I heard them calling and then one of them arrived. It was just heavenly. Now this one is a little bit blown out. See, my blinkies probably flashed for that. But I really wanted the detail in the blacks. As you can see, that green, that iridescent green, I wanted those details. So I brought the, the exposure exposed to the right, but the sun was setting and hit the white, so it was a little bit bright. So that's a tough one. Shooting black and white birds in the sun is tough. That's why maybe a little bit of the bright overcast when there's like a thin veil of diffusion, diffusion if the clouds are diffusing the light. It's a good time to shoot birds, black and white birds especially. Now I took a trip through Israel. It was a two week trip, I was alone. I stayed at different Airbnbs and some friends places. And I went to every single birding site from the north down to Eilat. So this was a place near Jerusalem. It was um, not very well known. I was very lucky to find out about it. And I was in a Corolla that I rented and I can't believe it, but I made it to this spot and used my car as a hide and just, I literally sat there for about six hours. They didn't even know I was there and just waited for that moment and got this. The background is slightly distracting, but it's showing the birds in their environment. And I went to Israel to photograph the Europe, European bee eaters. I was there in March, I believe. So this was one of, I left the next day and they had just arrived. So I was so happy to, to see these birds. But birding in Israel, I don't know if anyone's been, but it is mind-blowing. It's just incredible, the migration. Oops. These are roseate spoonbills having a little interaction. This is in, um, at Peaceful Waters in Florida. This is in New Jersey. I'm sure some of you know this spot. These are juvenile peregrine falcons. This was on my way to Nickerson. Also, I like to photograph exciting moments like these little sandpipers i believe these sandpipers 
Please correct me if I'm wrong, if that's not Elise Sandpiper. Um, someone could just unmute and, and yell what it is. But the, this guy, if you look closely, was drowning this other little guy, but he did, the little guy underneath the water made it out safe and sound. The, the one on top just wasn't happy about something. Nickerson again, some skimmers. I call this fight club, but <laughs> dance or a dance of love, but it's fantastic to witness. Same thing, this was Bosky. It was a very foggy day. I was like, what am I gonna be able to photograph in the fog? I, I hadn't really photographed in the fog much before. And I was very pleased to get this interaction. If you look really closely, I don't know if you can see, but there are some red feathers that have been plucked out of the guy on the right's head and are kind of floating around. It wasn't the most loving type of interaction. I think I would call this more of a territorial dance or fight club. And some people call this a race. I posted this on Facebook and I said, let me say, some, some kerfuffle at the pond, but everyone considered it a race, like a photo finish race. Two male wood ducks. And they have their nictitating membranes uh, closing in a little bit. The nictitating membrane is the, is the third eyelid to prevent any type of damage to the eyelids. Uh, I just like saying nictitating membrane. <laughs> um, I love photographing cute birds, little fluff balls, like this Virginia rail. He, I don't know how, but he came out to say hello. I was just sitting there so peacefully, and maybe I kind of visualized it and put it out there to the universe. And this little fluff ball came out, and he was, he was so cute. His mama came out, and his mama fed him, and then they ran back into the reeds. I love that little guy. And these are so ugly that they're adorable. These are baby wood storks at Wakotahatchee. And this actually was also shot recently. So I have two shots with my new camera. Um, this one I'm lying in the ground, on the ground. Oh, speaking of which, be super, super careful for ticks. Um, there was just a study done by um, Bird Protection Quebec here in God Manchester, which is an hour from where I live. And they looked at a bunch of songbirds and they pulled a bunch of ticks off of so many different songbirds. And 42% of the ticks were carrying Borrelia. Bor Borrelia burgdorferi is Lyme disease. So just be super careful. Uh, you can use 30% DEET, which is super strong and not so good for anything plastic or nail polish or anything like that, or skin or children. Don't use DEET on children. There's 20% Icaridin or Picaridin. I'm pretty sure you guys can get it in the U.S. as well. I'm, actually, I'm not sure. I've never bought it there. But picaridin or acaridin, 20% is just as effective as DEET, and it doesn't eat through everything, and it's not dangerous to children. So because I lie down in the grass a lot, which is not smart, but I also tuck my, my pants into my socks. I, I put the DEET everywhere. I do a tick check. The second I come home, the clothes are off. I'm doing a tick check. I'm changing just to be safe. I've, I've had two ticks and in bed and it's it's not the most fun so i'm trying to avoid that and okay so about four or five years i spent waiting for least bitterns to fly by in a split second and you wait for about three hours and there's one least bittern and then it's gone and it happens maybe twice or three times in three hours this baby least bittern if you look closely you can see the fluff on his head he's just fledged he came out waiting for mom, actually it was dad, to come in with a fish and feed him. And I, I don't think, I don't know if I was crying. There were a lot of people there at that point, but I wanted to cry because I was so happy. And then he was all puffed up. This is um, a common tern that escaped from his nest and went running down the beach. I happened to be lying on my belly photographing um, an oyster catcher. And this guy literally just ran by. So this was a very, very lucky shot. And then mom came and started dive bombing him. Like, Get back to the nest. And then he ran back up to the nest and he was fine. He was safe. Very cute. This is a wood duck, little baby wood duck with his reflection. And I also love to photograph moments of feeding. So here's mama or papa, I'm guessing daddy common turn coming in with a fish for his baby. And I can't see it right now because 
my screen is, is um, I've got you guys on the bottom, but I think you could see an, an egg that's about the same color as the baby. So this guy had just hatched, I think the day before, and the egg was still there, fresh out of the egg. This is another place. This is where the wood ducks are by the pond. And I heard the, the call, so I ran over. Turns out that this female red-shouldered hawk on the left, it's, it's a little different from the red-shouldered hawks in Florida. Maybe, maybe you guys have similar looking red-shouldered hawks, but the female on the left was calling and the male came in screaming his head off. So couldn't really miss this with a snake for his mate. And the, the handoff was about, I don't know, a second and a half. So I got really lucky with this shot. And this is a little blue heron with his catch and I'm lying in the water here again, loving it. This is Africa. And this is a harrier hawk with a very cool colored dead something, lizard of some sort. Um, that's all I can do to identify it. Actually, someone once told me the name because they recognized the color, but that's the Harrier Hawk. And okay, here's a good example. We had no light here. So I bumped up my ISO so high and I could only get, I don't even remember. Oh, no, it's, I don't uh, mention the speed, but I'm guessing the speed was like one one thousandth of a second because I've got the face of the bird sharp. So I was happy. I've got the face of the fish sharp. It's just the wings. And here I use the excuse. Okay, well, not the excuse, but it's showing motion. So it's okay because the face is sharp. And sometimes I actually blur the wings on purpose. You know, at night, I'll go down to 140, not at night, but sunset, when it's darker, I'll go down to 140th of a second. So I'll do more of an artistic shot and the wings are blurred. This one is kind of in between, but I still like it because the, the eyes are sharp. A lot of mating shots. Birds do a lot of mating. So in Texas, we've got some laughing gulls. In Israel, we've got some kestrels. Florida, we've got the great blue herons. This is Montreal. All the peregrine falcons are in Montreal. We've got some skimmers at Nickerson, some great egrets at Wakotahatchee, some gannets, Bonaventure in Quebec, Canada. Go, oh, Canada. We've got some American widgeons. Where was that? That was in Montreal, very close to my house. The mallards and the wood ducks at the pond, very close to my house as well. Now, I love owls, so I had to put a little section in on owls. Um, and I do have a barn owl on my bucket list. I really, really want to shoot a barn owl. But here are the owls that I've photographed. Snowy owl and a snowy owl in flight. Now, he wasn't yelling at me. He was yelling, and this is not baited, he was yelling at a bird, an owl that was perched on a fence that I was photographing. And he came by screaming, so I turned and I photographed him. This is a great gray. This was the eruption four years ago, and I'm hoping next year, next winter, there'll be a bigger eruption because four years ago was magic. This one was also four years ago. This is no light whatsoever because it was snowing so hard that you can see all the noise in there, but I don't care. Now, here's a perfect example of what you don't want to see in a photo because this bird is very freaked out. As I mentioned, my friend almost walked right into him, took a photo for two seconds and then left. And then the one on the right, he was pretty relaxed, so that I'm okay with that. And this is Fernando. There's a guy that, attends that goes to this park this is another park called Angrignon Park in Montreal and he knows every single hole of every single screech owl and this one and he's named them so this one is Fernando and these were Fernando's babies um, I got to name one of them I named her Rhea because my niece was named Rhea and I just <laughs> thought this was so cute and this we had a boreal owl in Montreal this this winter and the winter before we had this guy um this was about an hour and a half from my home but i heard he was there so i took a little road trip this was actually january 1st it was a great way to start the year 
2020 turned out to be a little different. <laughs> but uh, anyway, this guy, I just want to mention, this, this is called High Key. So the background was quite, he was backlit and it was a gray sky. So I bumped up my ISO so that I could get all the details in the bird because it was dark. In doing so, I blew out the background. And I, it's called High Key, the white background shot. This is one of my favorites. I love watching them fly. It's the short-eared owl. And I love it. It just, for a split second, and I was so far away here, I was using a 600 millimeter with a 2X extender. So 1,200 millimeters, and it was, it's super cropped. This is about one-fifth of the, of the image. So you can imagine how far away it was. So it wasn't anything that I did, but he happened to look over in my direction for a second. Click, 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 got it. Um, so I like those. I like those images when they're looking in in my direction. And again, this one on the left was a little perturbed. There were some people behind me, and I think someone opened up a, I don't know, a wrapper or something like that. And this long-eared owl looked over. This other long-eared owl looks a little bit more, it looks, looks calmer to me, and I prefer that shot. This is a burrowing owl in Florida. And these guys on the left, these were right behind a Walmart. Do you guys have Walmart? We have Walmart, I think. Um, this was behind a Walmart parking lot in a big tree. And went this day, it was crazy bright, totally backlit, but they were the cutest things I'd ever seen, so I had to photograph them. And I did. I'm glad I did. And this one was a, just a walk I went on and I came across this very mean looking great, uh, great horned owl, but beautiful. And this was in Texas, um, almost ready to leave the nest. Great horned. And this is a barred owl, sweet looking bird. And I happened to grab him when he took off. He actually, it's the same post. And I think, I think he gave me an indication that he was leaving by pooping or peeping, peeing, doing that thing that birds do. And then he took off. Again, could have been a little faster, but I was, was not expecting him to take off at that point. This is in Africa. It's an eagle owl. I believe it's called a Veros eagle owl. This is another eagle owl in Israel. It's called a European eagle owl. So I love to shoot in any condition. I, I usually like it when it's you know, sunny with a slight veil of cloud, but I love shooting in rain. So it's a burrowing owl in rain. That's me actually photographing in a huge blizzard. There were, there were no birds there at that moment. And then this is a sandstorm, but it was my first day on Nickerson Beach. I don't highly recommend going onto a beach in a sandstorm with a camera. Not a good idea at all. Um, it gets stuck in all the buttons. Not good, not good. Also, any uh, seawater, ocean water with the salt, not good for the camera either. Um, so snow as a background could be really lovely. One eight, at least one eight hundredth of a second will freeze the snow. And I highly recommend just get some warm gear and get out there. So this is one eight hundredth of a second and the snow is frozen. This is one eight hundredth of a second and the, the rain is frozen. But if you want a different effect, this is one 250th of a second, and it blurs the rain, so it's more streaky. Depends on what you're looking for. This is a very funny looking, very young, very wet, um, great blue heron. Okay, I do not recommend this. This is Barnegat. I, I literally crawled out there on my belly, holding the tripod and moving it ever so slightly. I was with two friends, two guys, both of them fell. One of them lost their tripod down between the rocks. I'm sure a few of you have been to Barnegat Jetty and know what I'm talking about. I was super, super careful. But honestly, walking on wet, mossy rocks is not a good idea. Don't do it. Don't do it. Or don't, don't do that. Don't do what I did in this photo. So reflections and shadows. I'll go through this quickly. Um, I love shooting reflections of birds. I like to shoot the reflection on a third. But sometimes it works in the center. So these are sand partridges, partridges, 
in Israel. I'm actually in a blind for these. And this one, this is a chukar. And here I find that the reflection, that the line works in the center for this one and for this one. But I do like to put it on a third usually, or to put the horizon on a third. Uh, it's good to keep the whole reflection of the shadow, but in this image, I wanted to get rid of the reflection. I had the whole reflection, but I wanted everybody to focus on the eye, which is on the third. As I mentioned, you see the eye is on the third. Because our eyes, our eyes drawn to that third. Um, and I wanted people to see the detail of the feather and the preening. So I didn't keep the reflection in. Okay. If you're photographing one bird and it's far away, 5.6 is fine. If you're photographing one bird and it's very close up, you want at least F9 to F13, depending on how close it is. If it's multiple birds, F8, F13. Okay, I can't see this. But I think this is about F9, if I remember correctly. I've just, I've got everybody's pictures on the bottom, so it's cut off, but I think it's F9. Could have been F11. If I had enough light, I could have bumped it up a little bit more. This is F9. Okay, let me see if I can move this one second, please. No, no. Okay, sorry. I think it's around F9 because we've got more than one bird. So we want a greater depth of field so they're all sharp. This is Barnegat Jetty. These are the beautiful Harlequin ducks. Love them. Ah, here we go. It's on the top. F9. This one is F9 as well. You can tell the birds in the back are a little blurred, but I wanted the, the water in the background blurred. So F9 kind of worked. Um, I, I could have gone F13, could have done that. This is a F5.6 because it was far enough away. This was a, a good enough prop and the background was blurred. Those were trees with some snow on them in the background and I wanted that blurred. And it seems like the tips of the wings are sharp, the, the beak is sharp, the eye is sharp, the, the feet are sharp. So 5.6 in this one works because it was far, it's far enough away. So silhouettes. You want your silhouette to be sharp, as in this example. So you want to, you want to shoot as if you're shooting not backlit and, and you just want everything sharp. And this is sunset, backlit, bring the exposure down because the light is so bright and then you get the silhouette. And that's it.